Hey everyone, it's Denise Brown, and this is our Beginning Again podcast. This is a special podcast that we do before our Beginning Again retreat. And our third annual Beginning Again retreat happens October 29th. And one of our presenters is my friend, Heather Slutsky. Heather, it's great to see you. Thanks for being here today. It is so great to spend this time with you, Denise. Thanks for having me on. Okay, so we have over the years had really great conversations about grief and grieving and your journey after your husband died when you were 20, I was 28, 28. I was thinking today that you actually added insights into my book about beginning again after caregiving ends. And that would have been in 2014. So I was trying to remember when did we meet? Would it have been like 2012, 2013? Probably you and I met in person the first time in 2013, because that was when we had taken some time to spend time with my father. Yes, and it was so your gap year. It was my gap year. Yes. And we had taken, my, my husband and I had taken our son from Georgia to Illinois to spend a year closer to my family as my father was in his 80s at that point. That was when we met each other in person the first time. I can't believe it because it feels like yesterday I remember sitting at lunch and just having this fascinating conversation about your gap year. And then we did a podcast and then we kept connected. And then as life gets harder and busier, you know, we stayed connected on Facebook. And then you submitted a proposal to present at our beginning again retreat, which was awesome. So tell me why you want to be involved in this event. One of the things that came out of two things that happened really quickly for me. So the caregiving experience that brought me to you in the first place was when my first husband passed away. His, and I managed to stay involved with his family and well-connected to his family and a member of his family this whole time. We're coming up on 21 years since his passing. And in September of 2019, his mother died. And that was a really hard thing for all of us. And that in combination with COVID had me go down this really deep thinking about how we celebrate after loss, because my sister-in-law did one of the most beautiful, remarkable, giving things the first Christmas after her mother had passed. And it was brilliant. And I loved it. And that followed immediately by COVID and everybody redefining holidays and celebration over the last few years because of safety and all of that sort of stuff has just sent me down this rabbit hole about how we think about what we celebrate, why we celebrate it, what are the treasured parts, what are the parts that we do just because we do them, and how to reshape when our life changes so that we still bring all of the traditions forward that have meaning and redefine new traditions in a new time for our lives. Okay, first of all, that was a fabulous teaser for your workshop at the event because your workshop is around how do we recreate the holidays after yep. a loss? Yep. Okay, so now I'm not going to ask you anything more about the 2019 holiday season, because I want to be as surprised as our attendees about what your sister-in-law did. Okay, so don't tell us anything, so we'll wait to hear. And I love that we're doing this event at the end of October, because it is setting us up for how do we manage the holiday season, which can be tricky, because it might feel different we might feel the pressure to do something new. We might feel the pressure to continue something old. And then we're trying to figure out how does the death impact our relationships? And what's so interesting about your story is you were very intentional about keeping the relationships with your in-laws, even as you remarried. Mm -hmm. And it was the first transition that we made uh, was thanks to my first mother-in-law, who at one point looked at me as I moved away, because I moved about a thousand miles away um, after he died. And she said, we've lost enough. We're not going to lose you too. 
And she said it in front of enough of the family that that intention was clear. And so when it came time for me to tell her that I was dating somebody and that it was serious and on and on, that she was like, okay, cool, good. You should be happy. And I was gifted that from her because it is very rare that when you're widowed young and without children, that that family connection continues forward. But it has for us um, up into and including the fact that when one of my brother-in-laws got married two months ago, they let me officiate the ceremony for them. And so that connection remains really deep and really powerful for us. And one of the gifts of that was that I have been able to imagine a whole bunch of things that I don't see a lot of precedent for, which I hope translates in workshops and speaking to empowering other people to recognize their authority to imagine those things as well. So as you know, my mom died in August and she died a year to the date that my brother had died. And after she died, my sister and I were with my father on my father's birthday. Okay, my mom died on August 9th. My dad's birthday was August 17th. So we went out and it was the three of us. And at one point, my sister reached over and reached for my hand and said to me, can you believe this? Can you believe this is the size of our family now? Now we have another brother, but we have an older sister who is not a part of the family. So she's a loss to us as well. So we saw the family shrink in a way that felt just awful. And what I find so heartwarming about your story is that your family shrunk as well when your husband died and yet expanded because it included your in-laws and all the additions to the in-law family. Yes. So in a time of loss, you felt the loss and you feel the hole, and yet there was something that filled in around the hole. Right. And of course, there have always been moments where I thought, well, is this the bridge that I cross that I can't take them with me? And I think that that the more unique you feel in your family situation, the more often you think, well, is this going to be the bridge? Is this going to, I know that they love me, but is this going to be the bridge? And so far I have not crossed that bridge. And my son is, is a cousin and all of that has continued apace, which has been really lovely. And at the same time, the, my birth family in that same period of time um, has lost their oldest generation. Our oldest generation is now, we've sunk a level basically. And in looking at that set of family relationships and the way that we deal with each other, there's a whole different kind of loss that comes with that because there are the stories and the witnesses to the stories that just aren't there anymore. I can imagine the last of my great aunts died this year and I can see myself in her kitchen at eight, nine, 10 years old. I can see that kitchen as clearly as I can see anything. And we have run out of people who ever stood in that building. You know, that we're getting smaller and smaller numbers. Nobody who ever cooked in that house is still alive. All of those as families shrink, the witnesses to those moments, the people who can confirm that that really is what our uncle did that year, her, 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 those witnesses go away. And that changes the stories we tell around the table when we do get together. I'm curious how you described your relationship with your in-laws when you really became serious with your current husband. So what was wonderful about that is I think 
I think there is a real difference between people who are single because of being widowed and people who are as there was nobody for me to go back to. And so as we met, as we started to date, I was, I said, I go back to Illinois all the time because that's where my family is. It's where my mom and dad are. It's where my first in-laws are. And after I decided that how I would always refer to them is as my first in-laws, they're not my late husband's family. They're mine. They are my in-laws. They're just the first set of them that I had. Then that all became very clear. And my son has a cousin in that part of my family named John after my first husband. And I refer to my first husband as my John to distinguish him from the cousin. But even though my son and my first husband obviously never met each other, he knows those stories of my life where John was the person standing next to me instead of Dave, because that's what would be true in a family. And this is my family. That's really powerful. Something else about your story is that you did all kinds of things the first year after your husband died that um, <laughs> everybody says not to do. So you moved, you, you changed your job. I changed what my career did- path. I moved to a state where I did not know anyone. I dated before the first year was over. I traveled by myself for about six weeks, about six months afterwards. Yeah, I I have been supported by my family for a long time in trusting my intuition and knew going into my widowhood that my intuition was a solid thing that was reliable. And I did not discount that intuition as I went through that first year. And so if I had had an intuition that routinely took me down weird paths and stuff, maybe I would have made different decisions. But my intuition was pretty solid up until the moment that John died. And so I didn't see any real reason for it not to be afterwards. And so, yes, I I pretty much took the book of what women specifically and widows and widowers in general are supposed to not do and said, I, I'm going to take care of myself. I have the authority to be my own guide even now. And that worked out really well for me. I ended up in a city that I've lived in for almost 20 years. I have met people who are good to me and who care about me. And I have worked in a profession that I have loved for a long time. And none of that would have happened. Right. If that was not the path I was on when he was alive, I was happy. I had a good life. And this is a good life too, because there's not just one good life. Right. Yes. Yes. After my brother died, And he died suddenly at home. And he and my sister-in-law lived in a small apartment in downtown Chicago. So my sister-in-law lived in the apartment where he died. And my brother was tall and large. So when he collapsed in the living room, it was over a big piece of area. So she would walk around where he had died. It was very painful for her to stay in the apartment and we had encouraged her to do whatever she thought was right. And so she asked her financial planner, what, what do you think I should do? And he said, stay, it'll cost you money if you break the lease. Well, she almost lost her mind staying in that apartment. And she moved out in March and said, the worst thing I ever did was listen to that financial planner and let money be the guide of what I did. It would have been an investment in her sanity and mental well-being to break the lease, even just live temporarily somewhere else while she looked for a place to buy. Because she was, she, it was, it was destroying her. Right. And, and as much as her financial planner was probably trying to do a respectful and meaningful thing by saying, 
from a financial standpoint, this is how you protect what you have. Being able to access peace when it is so hard to come by is what people need in that first couple of years. And I know that you and I have talked about this before, but really, I don't think the first year is the hardest. I think the second year is the one that brings you to your knees. Like that is the one, that's where you get the award is making it through the second year. And so, and honestly, that is true for celebrations too. Your celebrations are the fir- in the first year are exactly and only what you want them to be. And if that is, I want to pretend that this day doesn't exist, cool, groovy, do it. Work on it next year. Because right now, your peace is the goal. Yeah, with my sister-in-law, we just gave her permission to do whatever she wanted to do. And she would say, you know what, I'd love to be with you for Christmas, but I can't. And we'd say, totally get it. Whatever, whatever is right for you is right for us. Because I think sometimes people are tempted to say, oh, you'll feel better if you're with us. Well, you know what, maybe not. <laughs> Maybe, maybe that'll make me feel worse. Right. And, and for as well-intentioned as come be with us, it'll be good to be with people. As well-intentioned as I believe that that almost always is. That also, if you do that, you'll also bring with you all of the things that you are as a social person. Like, are you a person who will get there and be there for 20 minutes and be like, nope, peace out. I got to go and be comfortable doing that, is that who you have been in your past? Then cool, give it a try if you want. But if I come to your house for dinner, I'm staying through dessert, no matter how much my soul is in knots. And sometimes it's better to just know that clearly about yourself and work from that. You know what, I also think I bring my emotional emptiness when I'm going somewhere that's not right for me. And that means that I'm going to be impatient, short-tempered, and not, not a good guest. It's not a pleasant experience. And so I think it's important <laughs> for everyone that I know <laughs> I've just got to stay because I don't have the emotional reserves to bring out my best. It is just not possible. Right. And the people who are inviting you to things out of love, if they are asking you to perform okayness for them, they're out of line. What a great statement. If someone is asking you to perform okayness, right? For their own okayness. Right. I don't want to think about my best friend sitting at home by themselves and potentially being sad while I am drinking cocktails and eating cookies. So I want them to be here for me and perform that they're okay, even if they are going to go home and hug their cat and put on the weighted blanket and regret that they spent time with me. Absolutely. I think about after, it must have been after your father died, I went to the bar that you had. I remember that. I I was so grateful that you came. That was so lovely. Yeah. So was it after your father died? Yes. Okay. And what, remind me what the event was just a like, (laughs) oh, it was like the, it was like the Friday night of the weekend of activities. Was that it is? And then you invited everybody just to get together. So when my father died, we, um, we knew that the funeral was going to be at his favorite place in the world. And that was going to be a limiting factor for people who wanted to pay their respects. And so we decided pretty spur of the moment. I can't remember right now. I think he passed on like a Wednesday. And we were like, we know we're so confident. We know where the funeral should be. And we know that we need and they want to wrap around us right now, because right now is where this pain is. And the funeral was going to be four or six weeks later. And so 
we just kind of reached out to people. And because my parents lived in a small town, like we went to the local like pizza place and was just like, can we rent the back room? And we just reached out via text messages and Facebook and all that sort of thing and said, if you know us, if you knew my father, he's gone now, just come, just come. And it was such a warm and loving thing. That was a place that I had not lived actively in 20 years at that point. And I had friends from high school who came, um, my high school sweetheart showed up and gave me a big old hug because he had loved my father. And just all of the people that would have come to a traditional visitation, when what they want to do is care for you, all you have to do is tell them where you are and they'll come. And so there we all were at the pizza place, having a couple of beers and talking about him and letting all of the, all of the parts of our lives cross. And then weeks later we had the funeral and that was about 300 miles away. So that's like why we knew it was a limiting factor. And it was a much smaller group. It was a much more, um, it was less raucous and it was as meaningful, but the relief in that first couple of days of saying, here I am, I'm in pain. You can find me at this pizza place on this night. Come if you can. And on Facebook, reinforcing being like, yes, if you're thinking she's not talking about me, I am talking about you. And to have people do that. And, and it was, it was just absolutely loving how much people will surround you in care if you give them a way to do it. So I think that is a fabulous way for us to close the conversation because you're actually going to help us do that for the holiday season. Yep. And I, I also think that it's a way for us to think about what's the loving act for myself. What's the loving act for myself? How do I communicate that? And then how do I turn it into a ritual? Absolutely. Even if, even if it's just a ritual for this holiday. Yeah, because they get to change. I think that's one of the things that we lose sight of with holidays is we think, well, we always go to auntie's house and we always eat this and we always do this. And the biggest, the biggest confusion in my life at the winter holidays, at the present kind of holidays is do we eat and then open gifts and then leave or do we open presents and then eat and then run out the door? Because depending on what part of my family I am with, those rules are different. So doing all of those sorts of things and looking at what it can be, what it doesn't have to be. And what I hope to offer in the workshop is giving people a place to sort out that like image of the holidays into its parts so that they can say, yes, I absolutely, homemade cranberry sauce is what I have to have. The rest of it, I can order from Whole Foods and warm up. And then I don't have to cook for three days, but I can have the food that is exactly what I need to have because it is the day that it is. Okay, so for some nourishment prior to the holidays, come to our beginning again retreat. It's free. If you're joining us to get CEUs, which you can, it's 20 bucks to get CEUs. And we offer CEUs to professionals in Illinois, as well as nurses, certified dementia practitioners, and certified senior advisors in all 50 states. So if you're a nurse and you live in Colorado and you need CEUs, coming to come to the Beginning Again Retreat. It's on Saturday. October 29th, and we start at 10 a.m. Eastern time. We go for three hours, six workshops, 25 minutes per workshop. We have found that 25 minutes is the magic number. So you can register to join us by going to caringourway.com. And when you create your free account, you can register to join us for the Beginning Again Retreat. However, we have all kinds of other events. So feel free to poke around once you join and see what else looks of interest to you. Heather, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to seeing you on October 29th. It's been a pleasure. I look forward to it. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.